But God's taking his children home. As we pointed out last week, one of the great things about being at Shore Acres is um, as we look around, there are people who have gone a long way with the Lord and we're getting near the end and we want to finish well. That's the deal. Finish well. And finish doing ministry. Marguerite and I had a great week. Wednesday we were out in our little march there in London, which was uh, interesting. Um, there were people on both sides of the main street, Dundas, and um, some people yelling back and forth. Some of us just making our point that, you know, children's lives matter. And it was interesting on the, uh, the Board of Education uh, had their sign going, every child matters. Say, so, maybe not. You know, I mean, what's happening to our young children who are being confused about gender and sexuality and, and not just being confused. Uh, the devil uses two tricks. He confuses and then he contradicts what God has to say. And uh, we're going to see that's exactly what he did uh, here in the book of Genesis as we take our second look at Genesis today. So um, I, I hope that you enjoyed last week. Um, I try to look at the big pictures in Scripture. And the reason I do that is not because I don't like the little pictures. But you can't know what the little pictures mean if you don't know what the big picture is. And that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. You, you can't begin talking about minutia if you don't understand where that minutia fits in the big game. And so today we're going to look at a few Hebrew words uh, that will help you see that Moses is so clever as he writes this book. I mean, absolutely so clever that he can just take a word, make it sound slightly different, and all of a sudden it communicates incredible meaning. And so we need to see those things, or we're missing what he's trying to get us to see. In fact, we'll see that on two occasions this morning uh, in the text that we're, we're going to look at. I just want to mention one thing uh, by word of advertisement. On Monday evenings at 8.15, I teach uh, a course in Life of Christ. If you're interested, just email me and I'll send you the link. So if you want to know what my email is, it's just basically my, my name, L H warad at gmail.com and I'll send you about what the link is to that. We spend about um, an hour and it's fairly, uh, I'm going to say it's fairly deep material. So we're, uh, it's, like, it's like taking a course in the life of Christ. That's what we're working on. Probably will take us most of a year to, uh, to do the course. Anyhow, having said that, Let's do a little bit of a review. Last week, I wanted you to see that um, the book of Genesis starts off telling you with the kind of God that we have. There's lots of people who believe in God, but the God they believe in, take for example our Islamic friends, they believe in God, they believe in Allah. You can't actually, even when you're in a place like Kazakhstan, where Marguerite and I lived for a while, you can't even use the Russian word bog because they don't like Russians. You have to use the word Allah if you want to speak about God. It makes for interesting missionary work if you're going to, to deal with people because it doesn't take you long to realize when you look at Allah and you look at Jehovah, they're not the same. They're definitely not the same. Jehovah is not a fatalist. Jehovah is not a determinist. Jehovah is a personal, loving God who's concerned about your life, just not about your obedience, but about the quality of your life. Jehovah God is a personal God. So as we looked at the text last week, we saw in the beginning, God. This is the pre-existent God. He is before anything was. Whatever came into being came into being through him. The second thing we notice is that he was, uh, what should we say, he was powerful and he was purposeful. He had a plan and the plan was to 
Remember, the earth was out with without form, and it was empty. He was going to take that emptiness and fill it. He filled what was empty. On day one, two, and three, he formed it. On day four, five, and six, he filled it. This is a God who is purposeful, who is powerful, and then as we saw, he's personal. This is, this is not the God who is far away. This is not the transcendent God as we know him in philosophy and maybe theology. This is the imminent God. He is present with us. Adam and Eve walk with God, at least for a little while. And we noticed something about this Jehovah. We, we took a look at the human being. And we noticed that in chapter 1, Genesis 26 and 27, there was this huge emphasis that Moses makes. Only six times in the Genesis account does he talk about creation. Three of those times are in one verse. Do you think he was trying to get your attention? I think so. Not only three times created, 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 but three times in God's image, in God's image, in God's image. Whatever else we know about the human being, we know that the human being is made in the image of God. That's God's intention for us. And I tried to point out last week, you are here on purpose, and you are here for a purpose. See, God made you and God made me to glorify him. This is at the heart of the Christian message, right? I'm the Lord your God. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other God but me. That's, that's what we're talking about here. It is God first. You are here on purpose, and God's purpose for you is to glorify him in this world. It's what Jesus says. Let your light so shine before men that they might observe your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We are here on purpose. We're here for that purpose created in God's image. And then we noticed something about Adam and Eve. We noticed not only that they were in God's image, we noted what God intended for them. In God's image, in God's presence, under God's instruction, at rest, naked, and not ashamed. Think of that. Think of a world Think of a life where there is peacefulness. Think of a life where there is no, what should we say, dissension. Think of a world where there is uh, no lack of trust. Think of a world in which there is safety. That's what our world is so concerned about today, right? Safetyism is one of the, the key issues in our society. All of that, God created for his. And, and you say, and I ask you, can you imagine that? And of course you can. Maybe you can't imagine it in the past. Maybe you can't imagine it in your life right now, but you can imagine it in your future because that's where we're headed. We're going to be in God's image. We're going to be in God's presence. We're going to be under God's instruction, and we are going to be at rest. You see how the whole Bible, the whole picture of salvation and what God wants for you is seen way back here in Genesis. And so in the first two chapters of Genesis, God says, here's the plan. And it is not by accident that the apostle John begin speaking about, if you will, the, the whole of the Genesis thing being fulfilled. You come to chapter 19, 20 uh, of Revelation, all of a sudden you're seeing Genesis come right back to the core. See, it's gonna be great. Here's what we have to pay a little attention to today. This word, naked. Now, I know in a Brethren Assembly, talking about naked isn't often a, a good idea, you know. Uh, but we have to look at this word naked. 
or ram. They, they were naked. And now look at the way Genesis chapter 4 starts. Genesis chapter 3 starts. It starts with the devil who is or womb. See how the, the words sound very similar? Oram, Oram. Oram, Oram. And, and so here you are, you've, you've got this beautiful little story of, of Adam and Eve, okay? They're, they're in this garden, they're, they're under God's instruction, they're at rest. I mean, it couldn't get any better. Oram, they're naked and not ashamed. It just couldn't get any better, but Oram is just around the corner. And so the text starts off saying in chapter 3 what? Now the serpent was more crafty. <laughs> as soon as you hear this word, or womb, you know trouble is in the near future. And so that's what we're going to see. And the attack begins as soon as we hear that this devil is, this serpent is sly, he's all womb. We know that Adam and Eve are going to be under attack. And the attack begins. And it begins so easily. It's kind of like, oh, I was wondering, uh, hi, Eve, how are you? I haven't met you before or seen you around the garden. Maybe you've seen me. What do you think? You know, I heard a rumor somewhere that God might have said something like, don't eat of that tree over there. And she replies, what? Well, yeah, we're not supposed to eat of that tree, and we're not supposed to touch that tree. Now, most people spend time talking about the touching. They're not supposed to eat, okay? Let's just not lose sight of that. Then the devil says, What did God tell you? Well, he told us that when you eat of that tree, dying, you are going to die. No way. God wouldn't say anything like that because God knows that in the day you eat of that fruit, you're going to be like God himself. You're going to know good from evil. That's got to be the biggest lie in history, right? Because all through the prophets, you find a little phrase going on saying, they didn't know good from evil. They don't know good from evil. They don't know good from evil. And we're living in a society, by the way, that is suffering from that same problem. We don't know good from evil anymore because the Judeo-Christian ethic, the message of God to this world, is being so stifled and our society's not learning that anymore. We don't live in a Christian nation anymore. And that's a sad, sad thing. But anyhow, I don't want to go down political roads this morning. See? But here's the thing you have to understand. And you always have to put these great truths in the scripture in, into common sense terminology. Did you see what the devil managed to achieve? He told Eve and through Eve, Adam, that if you want to be good, you have to do bad. Does that make any sense? So if you really want to become like God, what you have to do is you have to disobey God. They missed that. And sometimes we miss that too. There will be many people here who could remember a time in their life when they were telling somebody about God told them to do something that surely God wouldn't have told them to do. Because it was contradictory to what God says in the scripture. We, we, we know what that's all about. We fight sin in our lives. Well, anyhow, by the time we come to the end of chapter 3, what we have now is Adam and Eve, who were in God's presence, in God's image, under God's instruction, at rest, are now, well, the results are disastrous. They're filled with guilt and shame. They are hiding from God, the only one, by the way, who can help them. And they were evicted from the garden. 
Chapter 3 is just such a chapter of reversal. Everything God wanted in chapters 1 and 2 has now been reversed. And Adam and Eve are out of the garden. But, and this is where we're going to start talking about what I want to talk about today. They have two promises. Okay? And the first promise is this. You remember that when God is cursing those individuals, Adam, Eve, and the serpent, he says, the serpent, you are cursed. You're going to crawl on the ground. And then he talks about, and there's coming a seed to this woman that is going to crush your seed. There is coming descendant to this woman that is going to crush your descendant. Literally, in a sense, going to stomp on the head of the devil. I mean, this is an incredible promise. The promise of the son. And so you can imagine now, Adam and Eve, they are out of the garden, but they have this promise. And Eve just thinks, you know, she's going to have pain in childbirth, because that's part of the promise. She's going to have pain, but also the Savior is going to come. That, that Savior is going to come through her, through her. You can imagine as they begin th- starting their family life, which is what we see in chapter 4. Adam and Eve are starting their family. She's thinking, wow, maybe the sun is going to come. Maybe that seed is going to come. And all of this will be changed in a moment. But what happens is something quite different than that. Chapter 4, Adam and Eve, as I mentioned, begin this life. They have a child. His name is Cain. I don't need to tell you the story of Cain. Here's a story that you do need to know and we'll look at in further detail in the future. Cain is like every other firstborn son in the book of Genesis. There is not one good firstborn son in the book of Genesis. Think about it. Now you know that, okay? You haven't thought about that before maybe, but you know that because it's not going to be Cain. It's going to be Seth. It's not going to be Japheth. It's going to be Shem. It is not going to be Esau, it's going to be Jacob. It's not going to be Ishmael. It's going to be Isaac. It is not going to be Reuben. It is going to be Judah. See, it is not going to be Manasseh. It's going to be Ephraim. You get what I'm saying? So this is, this is a pattern that runs strong through the book of Genesis. And Cain, this firstborn son, what a huge disappointment he is. He, he brings the wrong kind of a sacrifice before God. He kills his brother. And, and then he argues with God about the whole thing. Surely, Adam and Eve come to the place where they recognize, while they had this hope for this great Savior, Cain can't be that. He just can't be that. And now we come to the second promise, which is what I want us to see this morning. But it's not a promise you probably have thought about before. Okay? It's the promise of death. When you eat of that tree, dying, you will die. As Paul puts it in the book of Romans, death came upon all men. All humanity. And so we have this scripture back in the second chapter. In the day you eat of that fruit, dying you will die. That's the second promise, the promise of death. So let me read this for you. In verse 17, okay, of this fourth chapter, Cain made love with his wife, and she became pregnant, and she gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. I thought they were supposed to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. He's making a city. How? We're not quite sure how many people are around at this point in time. We don't really know. But we know that 
From Moses' point of view, he's doing something he shouldn't do. But anyhow, Cain made love to his wife. She became pregnant, gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad was the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael was the father of Methusael, and Methusael was the father of Lamech. He's in the seventh position. He's the finisher of this genealogy. We won't talk too much about genealogies today, but notice what happens. Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other named Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal, and he was the father of those who lived in tents and, um, and raised livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who played stringed instruments and pipes Zillah also had a son, Tubal-Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal-Cain's sister, why, now why this? Tubal-Cain's sister, you just get the name, Nema. The word Nema means beautiful or lovely, okay? And just store that thing in your mind for a minute or two. Okay. Now, we've noted two deaths already. Dying, you will die. We have the death of Abel. And now we have Lamech saying he's killed another person. Chapter 4 doesn't say that all of these people in the genealogy died, but they did. But now our attention turns to chapter 5. And in chapter 5, we come to another genealogy. Let me read this chapter to you. This is the written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind... He made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. He named them mankind when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness. This is of great theological significance. We're no more now in the image of God. Adam's son is in his likeness, in Adam's image. But as we continue in the text, note what happens. After Seth was born, I would name him Seth, by the way, Seth's name means replacement. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years and he died. Okay. When Enosh, okay, um, when Seth lived for a total of 912 years, then and he, um, he had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Seth lived a total of 912 years, and then he died. As you read your way through this fifth chapter, you hear this phrase eight times. And he died. And he died, 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 and one more, he died. Eight, he died. What do you think Moses is trying to stress here? He's trying to tell you the truth that sin brings about death. The wages of sin are death. Death, death, death is everywhere because of sin. And we're not done with this yet. Okay? We're nowhere near done with this. By the way, of course, we have Enoch, who is seventh. Enoch, preacher of righteousness, he doesn't die. He walked with God, and he was not, because God took him. And there's only one other person Listed in that genealogy that doesn't die, his name is Noah. And if you don't know what Noah's name means, it means comfort. Right? Through Noah, comfort is going to come. But now, we have to see something else. 
I told you to keep your eye on that name of that woman, Nama. We come to Genesis chapter 3. Let me just read you the, the text there. Okay. Genesis chapter 6 then. Um, when man began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and then they married any of them that they chose. And the Lord said, when he sees this, my spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal and his days will be 120 years. Now, a lot of people love this little account, the sons of God married the daughters of men. And, and they build up this very interesting story about these are fallen angels who somehow come and impregnate women on the earth, and there are giants and whatever in the land. It's one possible interpretation. Unless you read the book of Genesis over and over. See, any time in Genesis, just like firstborn sons don't really do well in the book of Genesis, any time you look at a man who marries a woman who is not from Israel or not from the family of God, you got trouble. Okay? How do you know that? Well, take a look at Ishmael. When Ishmael gets married, we're told specifically, and you know Ishmael is going to be a problem, right? I mean, you're already told that in the text. What does Hagar get as a special present for Ishmael but an Egyptian woman? When you move to Jacob and Esau, okay, well, you know the story of Isaac. When, when Isaac is going to get a wife, he, it's not going to be from the Canaanite people around. What's going to happen? Abraham's going to send his servant back to the homeland and find a woman from the right thing. Jacob is the same deal, back to the homeland. Going to find a woman, actually finds two. By the way, the one that he liked isn't the one he was supposed to marry. Leah is the real deal. The king comes from Leah. That's important for us to remember in the book of Genesis, but that's, that's in the future. But so what I'm saying is throughout the book of Genesis, what you have is godly people constantly being warned of not marrying ungodly women. So what fits with how Moses is thinking here, in my mind, is that the sons of God are the descendants of Seth. And, and the daughters of men are the, are the daughters, if you will, of Cain. Okay, they come from the descendants of Cain. And so what happens in chapter 5 is all of a sudden you see sin increasing and increasing and increasing until you come to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 where we have this statement. Every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. Basically, there's none that doeth good. No, not one. With one exception. Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. But I don't want to get to grace yet. Death, Cain's death. Whoever Lamech killed, their death. All of the line of Seth, their death. And now, Genesis 6 through 9, what happens is the death of all humanity, other than Noah, Mrs. Noah, Ham, Shem, Japheth, and their wives. Death, 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 everywhere. Then you come to a verse, Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. But Noah found grace 
in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And, and what I really want you to see this morning is, yeah, there is this death. And this death is, is overcoming, if you will, the righteousness in the world. But here's the promise that we have in John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, all things made by Him. Without Him, nothing made that was made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men, and the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness could not destroy it. The light is never going to be destroyed. And all through this passage, okay, chapter 3, all the way over to chapter 9, the destruction, the flood, whatever, where everything on the earth is dying, God's message is, there's grace. God is a gracious God. How, how, do you, how can I possibly say that in the face of all that death? Well, let's start off with the curse, the curse of the devil. There's a promised baby, the promised savior, the promised rescuer, the promised one who is going to come and stomp on the head of the devil. That is grace, okay? There's another thing. In chapter four in verse 15, God has told Cain that he's going to be running from people his whole life. He's going to be a vagabond. He's going to be separated from his whole people. And what happens is he says to God, God, I, I, can't, I can't bear this. I, somebody's, somebody's going to kill me. And God says, I'm going to put a mark on you. I'm going to protect you. God's grace, even to Cain. Go a step further. The preaching of Enoch to his own generation in the New Testament, he's called a preacher of righteousness. He preaches grace. He preaches repentance and grace. Take, for example, the life of Noah. Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah is a righteous man. God's grace comes. And God's grace comes in the form of the last thing we'll talk about today, the ark, which we know is not simply an ark, but is a picture of the Christ. You know, we're not going to go today into all of the stories of the Pentateuch, but it's interesting how Noah passes through the water, Moses passes through the water, Elijah passes through the water. I mean, it's interesting. Over and over and over again, Joshua passes through the water. One final thought here. Here's a question you might want to ask yourself as you keep reading. What goes on the ark beside Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives and all of the animals and whatever? What goes on the ark that you never think about? And the answer to that question is sin. Just as we're getting ready for, for huge victory, the next thing we're going to see is how it is that when Noah comes off the ark, the first thing he does is he makes a sacrifice. And then after he makes the sacrifice, he receives a blessing from God, a promise from God. And then the next thing we see is Noah, naked and drunk in his tent. It's sad. And as a reminder of the fact that you and I were never home free. 
We always need the grace of God. And we always need to be pressing on in righteousness. We always need to be seeking God. God said, seek ye my face. And I said, thy face will I seek, O God. Well, that's the end of our second lesson in the book of Genesis. In November, I have three weeks, and we'll do three more lessons from Genesis because it's a very incredible book when you begin looking at all the little things that happen in it. Let's pray together. Father, we don't want today to just be an exercise in talking about interesting historical events and uh, plays on words. It's a powerful story of what sin can do to destroy our lives. We see it everywhere around us. We, we hear the words of Jesus as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, so it is in the days of Son of Man. And so we look to you today as we live in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, partying, taking in marriage, whatever, making money, all of those things, we reminded of the fact that you are a God of grace. And we're reminded of the promise in Philippians that the one who began a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.